This is lecture 16 on skeletal muscle 2. We're going to be actually picking up where we left off from lecture 15 and starting into the process of skeletal muscular contraction and breaking down the three major steps. So in the last lecture, we actually discussed generally about the skeletal muscular contraction. Now there are three major steps that actually allow for this to occur. The first are the events at the neuromuscular junction where a nerve impulse travels from the nerve and then to the muscle. From here, we enter into excitation contraction coupling. This is where an electrical potential on the surface of the actual muscle cell goes deep down into the muscle cell and converts it over to a calcium signal that allows muscle fibers to actually bind to each other. So this calcium signal is going to end the excitation contraction coupling and begin the final phase of contraction relaxation cycling. In contraction relaxation cycling, we'll talk about the sliding filament theory and how we actually have our two protein filaments slide across each other to produce a muscular twitch. And then we're gonna combine those muscular twitches together to get a full muscular contraction. But first, we need to start with the events at the neuromuscular junction. Now here we have the neuromuscular junction. Every motor unit consists of a single motor neuron that forms a special kind of connection or synapse with a few or many muscle fibers. And remember, a muscle fiber is a single cell. The nerve terminal or synaptic terminal ends a very short distance from a specialized region of the muscle fiber. You can see that here. It forms a slight indentation. This is called the motor end plate. This narrow gap between the neuron and the muscle cell is called the synaptic cleft. There is no direct electrical connection between the neuron and the muscle cell. This is very important to understand. So what this event and what this step is actually looking at is how electrical signals or action potentials from the nerve become or stimulate rather the muscle cell to initiate action. Now, how does it do this? It does this by converting that electrical signal into a chemical signal. And that chemical is thereby going to diffuse across that synaptic cleft space and onto the muscle fiber. This chemical signal binds to the receptor cells on the muscle cell membrane and generates an electrical signal in the muscle cell. This process is called synaptic transmission. Now let's go through the different steps. An action potential or electrical signal is going to go down the axon terminal. And once it reaches the axon terminal, it's going to out activate those voltage gated calcium channels that you can see on the side. Calcium will thereby enter the cell diffusing in and it will act as a second messenger signaling the small vesicles of acidiocholine that you can see inside the axon terminal, otherwise known as ACH, to actually move towards the end of that axon terminal. So the ACH is gonna to move to the cell membrane and it's going to exit. It's going to actually go out via excitosis and leave the cell. Acidiocholine will then move across the synaptic cleft by simple diffusion, and then it will bind to the target cell and create an action potential on the muscle cell. By binding to those actual receptor sites on the motor end plate, it will cause that electrical action potential to continue down on the muscle fiber. And it does this by opening up the channel to allow sodium to go in. This will cause an electrical potential to keep going. I'm now gonna break it down into very easy steps that will help you to kind of remember it a little bit better. So the easy steps are, again, that action potential is going to be generated from the neuron and head down to the axon terminal. At the axon terminal, it will activate voltage-gated calcium channels. The calcium that diffuses into the cell will activate the ACH. Remember, this is acidiocholine, a neurotransmitter that is going to help with communication. ACH vesicles are going to move through exocytosis, which is that process of exiting the cell and simple diffusion and cross that synaptic cleft. From there, acidiocholine binds to receptors on the target cell, the muscle cell, and to transmit the action potential. The acidiocholine is then broken down at the actual 
uh, motor end plate and the process starts over if more contractions are desired. If you contract and then go to relax, the acetylcholine is broken up and then no more contractions can occur. So now that the action potential is actually reached the muscle cell, it's going to spread across the surface, the sarcolemma, all the while activating the different sodium potassium channels in order to move and jump from channel to channel. So the action potential is going to travel across the actual sarcolemma and then eventually reach the structures that we've already talked about called the T-tubules. The T-tubules are going to allow that action potential to head down into the actual muscle cell until it reaches an area called the triad region. The triad region that we can see here is where the T-tubule meets the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, this is to show you in this diagram of where the actual sarcoplasmic reticulum is. Remember, it's going to be the blue net structure around it. And the T-tubules are going to actually have be little holes that extend down and into the muscle cell. So this is going to happen in a three-dimensional manner to where the actual action potential heads down the T-tubule, reaches that triad region where that sarcoplasmic reticulum is, and then the next structure, or the next step as far as calcium release is going to happen deeper down inside the actual myofibril. So here we can see another view where that action potential is spread across the surface of the sarcolemma and then is heading down into the T-tubule. Once it's down into the T-tubule, it's going to head to that triad region and there voltage-gated proteins known as dihydro pyridine receptors or DHP in the T-tubule of the sarcolemma are mechanically linked. So you can see it's going to be linked there to the ryanidine receptors or RYR. And it has that kind of coil structure where it connects it to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. What this means is that uh, as that electrical signal comes down into the triad region, it's going to cause a change in the shape of the DHP receptor. And it's going to change mechanically, it's going to unlock that ryanidine receptor, the RYR protein that's on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the action potential comes down, it's going to turn the key of DHP to unlock RYR, thereby allowing calcium to diffuse out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and into the actual sarcoplasmic sp uh, space. So that electrical signal is gonna cause the change in DHP to unlock, it's going to open that sarcoplasmic reticulum and allow calcium to diffuse down. So what we're gonna have next is going to start the phase of muscular contraction. So as calcium is released, it's going to diffuse down. Now, remember those two proteins we talked about back in lecture 15 are gonna be tropomyosin and troponin. Now, tropomyosin partially blocks myosin binding sites, and troponin is going to be found on the tropomyosin. These are actually going to be proteins that have a calcium binding site, and they control the position of tropomyosin. So calcium will diffuse down from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, bind to troponin, and allow tropomyosin to move. So the contraction of muscles is actually very much regulated by calcium here, as we can see. Now, just like the events at the neuromuscular junction, I'm gonna simplify it for you, give you some easy steps to help you remember that somewhat complicated procedure of events. So again, we start with that action potential that is on the surface of the sarcolemma. It will then go to the T-tubules and then head down the triad region using the sodium potassium pumps. From here, that electrical signal is gonna change the DHP to unlock the RYR and release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium then moves rapidly through diffusion into the sarcoplasm and calcium will bind to troponin. When the action potential stops, calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum using ATP. This is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, calcium ATPase. Just as a reminder, when calcium binds to troponin, it is going to move tropomyosin. 
This is actually going to be the calcium binding to troponin is going to be kind of where we end this uh, phase, the excitation contraction coupling, because then we're going to move into actual contraction relaxation cycling and talk about the sliding filament theory. Um, but before we finish with excitation contraction coupling, I want to talk a little bit more about how we get rid of calcium. So if you remember during the events at the neuromuscular junction, I talked about eliminating ACH, acetylcholine. By eliminating acetylcholine from the actual receptor site, we stop muscular contraction. That's one way. The other way to stop muscular contraction is to get rid of calcium. Now, to stop contraction from occurring and getting rid of calcium, we do this through a calcium transport protein in the sarcoplasmic reticulum called the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. It pumps calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum using intracellular calcium concentrations. As calcium concentration decreases, tropomyosin will thereby move back to its original position covering the myosin binding sites on the actin and therefore the myosin and actin can't bind to one another. We're now going to finish up with the very final phase of muscular contraction and look at contraction relaxation cycling. Here we can see the different events laid out and it's all going to start with that binding of calcium to troponin. So before we actually get into the movement of the different myofibril filaments, we're going to talk about the resting and relaxed state. So here we can actually see that actin is going to be blocked by tropomyosin. Troponin is attached to the tropomyosin. There's no calcium present. And the myosin head itself is composed of an ADP hydrolyzed with a phosphate ion. So this is an inorganic phosphate molecule and it's, it, it's energy. It's ready to use energy and it's not touching the actin because the tropomyosin is blocking. So this is at our relaxed and resting state. Next, we're going to initiate our first contraction. And I'm gonna go through a, uh, at least two contractions here to kind of show you what's gonna happen. So our first that we're seeing is calcium is gonna come in release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and bind to that troponin. This will cause a movement of the tropomyosin, which exposes the actin. Myosin head will bind to the actin molecule and perform a motion called a power stroke. Power stroke is where it's going to pull the actin in closer together. So those two actin that we talked about when we looked at the sarcomere are now gonna move closer together as it power strokes in. In the process of actually performing the power stroke, we lose that phosphate ion because movement requires energy. Upon performing the power stroke, we are now bound in what we call the rigor state, where the myosin head is ADP. The phosphate ion is gone. We used it for work. We used it as energy, and it's, that myosin head is still attached to that actual actin molecule in the ratcheted state. This is the rigor state. Now, from that tight binding in the rigor state, we need to unattach it to be able to perform more contractions. So how do we unattach it? We need more energy. We get energy from ATP. So ATP is going to bind to the myosin. Once it binds to that myosin, it's going to thereby unattach from it. it will un uh, the actual myosin head will unattach from the actin. Now, once it unattaches from the actin, it's then going to immediately hydrolyze, to, that ATP will hydrolyze into ADP plus a phosphate ion. It's going to return back to that ADP plus phosphate, and it ratchets back to its original position to rebind. Upon rebinding, where that, AT, that ATP is hydrolyzed, it's thereby going to have a cal, if the calcium signal is still present, it's going to perform another power stroke where it's going to swivel back, power stroke again. So every time, as long as calcium and acetylcholine are present, it's going to keep performing power strokes because it's going to keep going to ratch, ratchet and bring it in, ratchet and bring it in as long as that ATP can keep coming in. 
So the actin filaments will keep moving closer and closer with more power strokes being performed as phosphate ions get broken off and they'll keep moving closer towards that M line. Now the myosin is going to remember release that ADP at the end of the power stroke to allow an ATP molecule to come back on. So let's go through the easy steps and break it down. So first, that tropomyosin is going to change position because calcium has bound to troponin, is moving tropomyosin. That myosin ATP head will hydrolyze, so ATP becomes ADP plus phosphate, and then it will bind to the actin, releasing the phosphate and performing a power stroke. Now, this is going to stay bound until a new ATP comes into the myosin head. And what can stop this? As we've said before, if we eliminate acetylcholine or we eliminate calcium, that's how we actually stop this process of hydrolyzing ATP and power strokes from occurring. Okay, so now we've generated an action potential. We've transmitted it from the motor neuron to the muscle and we cause the muscle fiber to contract. Now we want to actually look a little bit more closely at the contraction of a single muscle fiber. The contraction of a single muscle fiber is called a muscle twitch, not to be confused with that thing that your arm does while you're sitting there watching TV. So a muscle twitch, as we can see here, starts from the actual stimulus. Now the stimulus is going to be where that action potential crosses over. And then we have a break before contraction occurs. This from the stimulus to the contraction phase where nothing is occurring is called the latent period. All right, and we'll talk about the latent period a little bit more. I'm just giving names right now. From there, we increase tension development. Tension goes up. This is the contraction phase. Once we've reached peak tension and we start to see a downward turn of tension, we have now entered into the relaxation phase. So, just to go through it in a little bit greater depth, that latent period, remember, is from stimulus to contraction. During this time period, no tension is developing. The contraction cycle has not begun. This is because the action potential is sweeping across the sarcolemma and calcium is being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's the delay for these actual events to occur. From there, the contraction phase begins and this contraction phase is actually where calcium has bound to troponin and we can have the cross bridge cycling occurring cross bridge cycling is where the myosin head binds to the actin that is what is called a cross bridge now this is contraction phase remember is from the beginning of tension development to peak tension from here we enter into relaxation phase the relaxation phase is actually going to be from peak tension to the end of the twitch and takes about 25 milliseconds and calcium levels will fall. The active sites are covered by tropomyosin and the cross bridges, the myosin head attached to the actin, is going to detach. From here, the tension will return to resting levels and we've actually completed our twitch. Now the entire twitch that we talked about lasts between 10 to 100 milliseconds. So it's really fast. But you notice I said between 10 and 100. Now that is a huge range that you have there. Now why the big range? Well, that's because there are different types of muscle fibers as we're gonna get into. There's going to be slow twitch and then there's two types of fast twitch that we have. So there's gonna be different variety. An example of this is going to be the different twitch speed that we can see in three different muscles here. Comparing the eye muscle, which is gonna be the fastest and is gonna be a lot of type 2X fibers. The gastrocnemius is going to be type 2A fibers. So both eye muscles and gastrocnemius are gonna have a good amount of fast twitch fibers in them. Now the deep muscle of the calf, the soleus, that's gonna be a little bit slower and have more slow twitch fibers. So here we can see it's got a slower overall twitch speed and takes longer to generate tension based upon the actual different muscles and the different muscle fiber types. We're gonna get into muscle fiber type a little bit later. So now I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about muscle fiber length tension relationship. When a muscle fiber contracts, it develops tension or force. Now that tension development in an individual muscle is highly dependent 
on the starting length of the sarcomere, so that distance from Z-disc to Z-disc. Here we can see at the start in optimal length, the greatest tension produced due to the maximum number, number of cross bridges formed. This is gonna be our optimum tension length relationship. We can have things go one of two ways. If we're going down clockwise on the actual circle here, we can reduce the size of the zone of overlap. So if we reduce the zone of overlap, maybe extending or overstretching the muscle, we're not gonna be able to form as many cross bridges. And if we go so far as to actually separate those fibers and tear the muscle, we're not gonna be able to form any. Now let's go down the flip side here um, towards the left. We decrease our length and actually have more overlaps. This means we still can't produce enough tension because we can't move the Z lines together uh, enough to produce enough force. This is a very short distance it can move. Now, if we're already contracted, then no tension can be produced. So we can see if we have too much overlap or too little overlap, we can't produce enough force. Let's talk about that in a little bit more depth. So sarcomere length affects tension because the amount of tension produced in a muscle fiber depends upon that fiber's resting length, as I've stated. It does not depend on the number of sarcomeres contracted because all sarcomeres are stimulated and contract together. So it's the all or none principle. They're either all producing tension or they're all relaxed. Optimal resting length is where the maximum number of cross bridges can form and produces the greatest amount of tension. The normal range of the sarcomere length is between 75 and 130% of, of optimal length. So from there, the muscle arrangement, connective tissues, and bones usually prevent too much stretching or compression, so it allows us to stay within this optimal resting length. Now, if we actually stretch the sarcomere and start to stretch it out too much, we have a reduction in tension due to that reduced size of the zone of overlap and a reduced number of cross bridges that, that are allowed to form. At extreme lengths or extreme stretching, something like that, no zone of overlap can exist and no tension can be generated. This is normally prevented by the tightened filaments that we talked about. They tie the thick filaments in and, and connective tissues together and they prevent the actual separation of this. However, of course this can happen and this is going to be in that tearing that we talked about before. Now let's go to the flip side at decreased sarcomere lengths where we compress. We have a reduction in tension due to very little room to shorten before thin filaments collide with each other. Now when sarcomeres are fully compressed, the thick filaments are contacting the Z lines. And so no movement can actually happen and no tension can be produced. This is where we actually have a um, greater, or ex excuse me, a shorter resting length of muscle. So somebody that's very chronically tight, uh, that has a very tonic muscle, they're not gonna be able to produce as much force. That's why there's that optimal zone of overlap. Now there's not as many mechanisms to prevent this from happening as there are uh, to prevent the overstretching of a muscle. The best case to actually solve this is going to be simply learning to relax the muscle a little bit more and to try to get it to open back up or learn a new resting tone. So we've talked about the process of contracting muscles, we've talked about twitches, and then we've talked about the muscle fiber length tension relationship, which optimizes our twitches. But individual muscle fibers, while they can contract all or none, can't produce enough force to really move load with a single twitch. We have to combine these together. And this is done via summation and tetany. Wave summation is our first way. Here, stimulation of the skeletal muscle fiber before relaxation phase is completed produces increasing maximum tension, the addition of one twitch to another. The duration of the twitch determines the maximum time available to produce wave summation. So here's an example of wave summation where I'm contracting. I start the relaxation phase, but I enter a new stimulus into the actual twitch before I fully relax. And so it gradually produces more force over time. The next is going to be looking at tetany. And first we'll start with incomplete tetanus. 
Now, tetanos means a convulsive tension, and a lot of you probably know of the disease tetanus, where it's going to be a massive contraction of muscles, but tetany is actually something that occurs in our body naturally. It's just a disease that would not allow us conscious control over it. Now, incomplete tetanus is where we have a rapid cycle of contraction and relaxation, producing almost peak tension. It still shows a period of relaxation, so it's incomplete. Let's take a look at that. Here we can see we have this wave summation that's built up over time, and then at that top level, we have our incomplete tetanus. We can see that it's getting periods of relaxation, but it's maintaining a, a degree of overall tension. Now, our goal is going to be to get to complete tetanus. This is a, has a higher stimulation frequency and eliminates relaxation phase. Here, the sarcoplasmic calcium ATPase is saturated. We're releasing maximum calcium here, and it results in peak tension and continuous contraction. This is what occurs to create force in normally functioning muscles. So here we can see that nice smooth transition up where we have our calcium being released at maximum potential and our action potential frequency is very frequent. So it's occurring quite a bit to create a sustained overall level of fiber tension. So we've talked about the different processes that allow a muscle twitch to occur. We've talked about moving all the twitches together, but remember for all of this movement to occur, we need energy. And energy is gotten in the form of ATP. Now, muscle uses more energy than almost any other system in the body except for the nervous system. And ATP in muscular contraction is needed for three important processes, which I have not listed on the PowerPoint, but are in your lecture notes on page four. Myosin actin cross bridge cycling, which is where it releases the myosin from the actin to perform the power stroke action. The next is going to be at the sarcoplasmic reticulum, calcium ATPase, where it pumps calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then via the sodium potassium ATPase. So these are going to be the different channels that are going to be on top of the sarcolemma, and it's going to ensure that there is a correct sodium potassium level inside the cell. Now, there is a problem. Our first system of using ATP is simply free ATP that's in the skeletal muscle. Now this is very minimal. It supports um, at maximum 10 muscle twitches, so not very much. So that means we need energy systems in place to be able to generate more overall energy. <clears throat> Our first system is going to be the phosphocreatine energy system or creatine phosphate. Here, creatine is synthesized during the times of rest and is stored for use during times of exercise or need to regenerate ATP from ADP. It's also a very popular supplement. The average recommendation based upon the research is about five grams per day. Again, if you decide to take a supplement, please see a doctor first. Now, creatine phosphate, what does it do? So it's going to allow more energy to become available. It supplies energy for about 15 seconds. Um, so it's pretty useful overall in immediate energy system creation. Creatine is assembled from different amino acids and facilitates the regeneration of this ATP. Now, phosphocreatine transfers its phosphate group under the control of the enzyme creatine kinase. Creatine kinase is found in very large quantities in striated muscle, and in fact, circulating creatine kinase is used as a marker for muscle damage. Skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle have specific types of creatine kinase called isoforms. Now, clinically, creatine kinase tests are used to look for evidence of uh, heart or skeletal muscle damage. And this energy supply is also very limited here, but we can actually go through this process of taking ATP, we use it, and we get ADP. So from here, we take that ADP plus our creatine phosphate using creatine kinase, and then we get ATP plus creatine. So we break off an actual phosphate ion from that creatine to bind it to ATP. So what creatine does in our body is allow us to store more phosphate to be used for more energy later on. Our other energy systems we're going to talk about are glycolysis, anaerobic, and then aerobic metabolism. 
So the energy storage system in muscles, the muscles do store ATP and creatine phosphate, but remember that most energy in the body is actually stored in glycogen. Glycogen is going to be the stored form of glucose, and glucose is going to be essentially sugar in our body. This may account for about 1.5% of the total muscle weight, and it enables extended periods of muscular contractions. Now, there are two major processes of this, and we always start with glycolysis. Glycolysis is initially, it's anaerobic, and it does not require oxygen. Here, we're going to actually produce two ATPs and two pyruvate molecules for each glucose molecule that's put into the system. This is going to occur in the sarcoplasm. Now, if oxygen is present, we can take those pyruvate molecules and make more overall ATP out of them by putting it into the mitochondria. This is going to take it through um, different processes ending in the electron transport chain and end up producing about 17 ATP for each pyruvate molecule that you put in. So we're coming out with about 36 ATP when all is said and done. So a very high efficiency, a high efficiency system. So here we can see a diagram of the sarcoplasm in the mitochondria, and we'll start at the very top here with glycolysis. Remember, glycolysis does not need oxygen present to be able to happen. Here we take glucose that's naturally found in the muscle, we're gonna, or excuse me, the glycogen that's broken down into glucose, and then it is converted in the sarcoplasm to ATP, two molecules of it, and pyruvate, two molecules of that for every molecule of glucose. Now, if oxygen is present, those two pyruvate molecules will enter into the mitochondria and will go through the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain and will produce more ATP. So this is going to be aerobic metabolism is far and away the most efficient system to get a ton of ATP. Now, all skeletal muscles are capable of this type of metabolism if there is a sufficient oxygen supply, but it does take more time. We'll start with the energy systems again in lecture 17, but this is just a layout of those different energy systems that we've talked about and where the muscle fiber gets its energy from. So remember that free ATP is gonna be existing inside the actual muscle fiber itself, but this can only handle about 10 twitches and last under two seconds. Next, we would move to the creatine phosphate energy system. Here, we take ADP that has already been used by the muscle fiber and combine it with creatine phosphate. Via the actions of creatine kinase, we get ATP and creatine. Now, this is gonna support about 70 twitches per fiber, and it's gonna get about 15 seconds of work, maybe a little bit longer at most, maybe 20 seconds. Now, glycogen, is or glycolysis is going to be a lot more efficient. Here, we use our energy source of glycogen, and this is actually gonna support about 670 twitches and last for about a minute 30. From there, we have aerobic metabolism. Aerobic metabolism supports 12,000 twitches per molecule, per 100 millimole molecules of glycogen, and this can last upwards of 40 minutes of sustained work at maximum capacity. So obviously aerobic metabolism is gonna be by far the most efficient system. So it's important to have oxygen present to be able to, to sustain work for long periods of time.